Kia ora, tēnā koutou, uh, rauranga te rama, uh, kia ora Danielle. Um, thanks uh, for the invitation to speak today. I'd like to acknowledge um, Ash, Ash's office and also to acknowledge uh, the people we call the tangata whenua, the, the traditional owners of the land that we're on today. Um, so do... Do people have people done history in this <laughs> course? Oh, there's a few heads nodding. So I I um, like being asked to speak to scientists and medical people and people who don't often do history. Um, but at the same time, I struggle with what do I say? <laughs> you know, what does a historian say to a group that may not have done any history? So the, what I want to talk about today is roughly. Um, what I would say about New Zealand history if I was only allowed to say one thing. Um, and so I'm going to consider the way that Māori policy, which includes for us our health policy and welfare policy, uh, has developed in New Zealand. But my particular slant is to consider, um, I guess, the ideas about race that underpin policy in New Zealand, underpin policy about Māori. And for the first part, I'm going to borrow very heavily from arguably our most uh, uh, noted New Zealand historian um, at, the, at this time, James Balich. He's done quite a bit of work on racial ideology and how it impacted um, European understandings of the wars in New Zealand and why Europeans were so convinced that they had won those wars. Um, so, you know, as a bit of background, we had uh, some, we had wars in New Zealand in the 1860s, um, and peop some people say they were wars over land, you know, Māori land, um, Indigenous people's land. Some people say they're wars of sovereignty, it's the British trying to establish empire in New Zealand. Um, and Balich has gone and thought about the ways that racial ideology impacted the way those wars have writ um, been written about. And I borrow from his ideas and apply it um, to policy. So what I'm going to do to begin with is work through what he calls racial lenses, so different ways that, um, that Māori have been viewed uh, by Europeans. Um, and it, it's really just a toolkit it's a for thinking about race and, and a toolkit for applying to uh, different writings about Māori and and you know what different views are, are going on. So I'll whip through those very quickly just to give us a background. So he starts with the clear lens. So this is a relatively objective view of Māori. Um, it's a view that scientific voyagers took, like um, Captain James Cook, who. Um, took a scientific voyage to New Zealand in 17 1760s, he was. <laughs> yeah, 1769, Captain Cook and his crew. And so they were interested in just writing down what they saw. Um, and which is why you get this, uh, this clear idea. So they're just looking and describing physical features. But it's never completely clear, there's always a little, you know, the lens is never completely clear because they talk about Māori people being tall, but of course tall in comparison to what they know back in England. Um, there's some of the descriptions are about uh, Māori women having a sing-song voice, which again is in relation to what they know back in England. So it's never completely clear, but it's about as clear as you can get. And you get these, these kinds of images, they like um, drawing the facial tattoo, um, showing the jewellery, the cloaks. And then there's the black lens, this is the idea that, um, which was quite popular in the US, the idea that Māori can't be improved, that um, you know, once you're a savage race, that's all you can ever be, you can't learn, um, and now, Balich has argued that this is not a view of Māori that held much influence in New Zealand. I think I disagree with him. I think that there have been times in New Zealand where 
the, the so-called black lens had surfaced. I think it surfaced in the 1860s during the wars. You can pick up um, any newspaper practically from the 1860s and you will see Māori being, um, yeah, the, the N-word being used in relation to Māori. You see it again in the 1970s and 80s when uh, the Māori protest movement takes off and you get this kind of slamming of Māori and people saying, you know, it's all backward looking, what are they on about? Um, do they want to go back to their grass huts and grass skirts? That kind of attitude. The green lens might be a familiar one up here. The, the, this is the noble um, natural environmentalist, natural con uh, conservationist. Um, I think this is a view of Māori that still exists today. Like there's an assumption that Māori are somehow at one with the land, um, appreciate intrinsically how to how to look after the land. And I think that our culture lends itself to that way of thinking. But the difficulty that I have with this particular view is that it often fails to um, fails to acknowledge the scientific basis behind Māori understandings of the environment. So um, it fails to see that Māori knowledge of the poisons in some plants might be a scientific knowledge. You know, there's this assumption that it sort of, I don't know, there's a, everybody, if all the Māori's get born with an environmental gene and we somehow magically know that certain plants are poisonous at, at, and unless they're treated a particular way. But I'd like the view that scientifically some of my ancestors worked it out. Same way that they knew which woods were smokeless, you know, to, for fires, for indoor fires. Um, the same way they knew which rocks heated better for cooking food and wouldn't burst. I think they worked that out scientifically. I would say a similar thing about the, the red lens view, the view that Māori are naturally warlike and ruthless. Um, Again, if you go back into the 19th century and see some of the European writings about um, Māori and war, it's, it doesn't acknowledge uh, strategic planning. It's kind of, it's, you know, Māori are natural warriors. They, you know, give them any weapon and off they go, and without thinking, um, almost. But I think that we had some key war strategists who thought about war, who thought about, I th and I think that's why we were able to fight the Europeans so successfully. They understood that they had to adjust the way they fought because of the new technology that was coming in the form of muskets and different kinds of guns. So again, it, and it, it, um, this red lens view still turns up. Our national game um, arguably is rugby in New Zealand and I think the red lens view gets applied to Māori rugby players they're often described as natural, natural rugby players. Um, nobody ever says they're strategic and, and, and thinking um, players. Um, there's a lot of material in the 1960s, actually, 50s and 60s, where people comment on how difficult it is to discipline a Māori rugby player. So fantastic players of this game, but undisciplined. So it's this natural kind of ability to play this game that has to be somehow um, managed and uh, turned into the kind of performance that the, the rugby union really wanted. The brown lens um, is the kind of entertainment lens and this is another one that Balich says is not so prevalent in New Zealand and, and again I disagree I th um, partly because I have tweaked his understanding of it. So this is the idea that Māori would um, make good servants, make good housekeepers, um, or they, you know, or good entertainers. And I think there, there is a view of Māori as good entertainers. Māori in New Zealand are um, overrepresented in entertainment, in the music industry. Um, you won't often hear that. You'll usually hear about our overrepresentation in prison and in diabetes and asthma and heart disease. But um, I think we are also overrepresented in entertainment and again there's this view of um, Māori as natural singers, uh, natural musicians. I still get asked to play the guitar, I cannot play the guitar, 
I have a friend who said you should just try aroha because maybe you can and you just don't know yet. <laughs> you know, so the idea that you, you know, just pick one up and play it. Um, so that's the brown lens. So the lens I'm most interested in is this white lens, the, the view that Māori can be improved. So this is the view that the missionaries landed with in the 1810s in New Zealand. The idea that Māori were, you know, pretty, for, for, for a savage race, they were pretty good savages. They could learn. They had, um, by, by the 1810s, Māori were already trading, which was an indication that Māori could learn. Um, what was lost on them, of course, was that we were trading before the Europeans arrived. Uh, so, but the, the basic idea is that Māori were suited to improvement and missionaries could be part of you know, the work of cultivating that improvement. This is the lens that I think most influences the development of Māori policy in New Zealand. I think that Māori policy in New Zealand has primarily been about how do we whiten these Māori people? How do we make them more like white people? How do we make them more like Europeans? And that's been the push, I would argue, um, really from the 1810s. If, you want to, if we want to take it from the time of uh, government in New Zealand, then I would have to say 1840. But I still think it's a persistent push and one that pushes well into the 20th century. It's tied in part to the grey lens. This is the last of Belich's lenses. So this is the, um, the idea that really comes from uh, social Darwinism, the idea that um, uh, the weakest die out and only the fittest survive. And from, the, from about 1880 to 1920, it was a really strongly held view that Māori were dying out. Māori were a dying race. Um, apparently it was natural, couldn't do anything about it. There's a great quote from one of the, um, we called them superintendents there, who was the, I guess, almost like a mayor, so the, the top um, person in a, in a province. And he said, the, you know, the, the Māori people are dying out. We can't do anything to help them. It's just um, nature taking its course. The best thing that we can do is smooth the pillow of the dying race. And there's all this literature about how there would be no more Māori by the year 2000. Um, they were marrying into the European settler population um, and they would uh, eventually be no more. But, and, and part of that is the belief that at the end of the New Zealand wars in the 1860s, um, Māori no longer had a political body to, to lean on. There, were, there was... Um, no kind of leadership or uh, political entity that could co talk to government on the basis that uh, the Europeans won the war. So the grey lens for me combines with the white lens. So the idea is that the, in the face of dying out, the best option for Māori people would be to whiten. And it turns up in policy as amalgamation. So amalgamation was the idea that um, <coughs> Māori would be one under, Brit uh, under British law. So one people under the law, which in the 21st century, you can hear um, politicians in New Zealand still say that same thing. So one people under the law. Um, some historians believe that amalgamation was, you know, just legal and political and wasn't meant to be cultural. So Māori would be able to um, maintain some cultural distinctiveness but would be entirely under British law. That would mean that Māori adoptions would fall away, Māori medicine would fall away, um, uh, Māori tribal organisation would fall away, you know, everyone would be under the one law. By the 1900s that amalgamation had changed to assimilation and assimilation was very clearly total assimilation so social and cultural um, you know political economic total assimilation there would be no more Māori no, no such thing as Māori no such thing as Māori culture and again there are some great quotes from the period um, talking about uh, Māori would only exist as a golden tinge on the skins of New Zealanders 